Hello and welcome to the High Podcast with me, Natalie Nahai. In this series, I want to explore how the coronavirus has and is changing the ways in which we live. From its impact on our social, psychological and physical well-being, to its effect on our businesses, economies, our cultures and the climate. Crucially, at the heart of my inquiry, I want to unearth what unexpected opportunities the situation may bring, not only for our own lives, but also for the ways in which we want to build our future. I hope you'll join me as we dive into these big questions. And as always, if you'd like to know more, you can find additional resources and links at natalinahai.com forward slash the high podcast. And you can also reach out to me personally on Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn at Natalie Nahai. And if there's anyone you know who's really struggling right now, who you feel might be supported by the topics and themes and conversations that we hold within this podcast, please do send them a link. Thank you again for joining me in this strange time. I hope you enjoy the show. In this final episode of the season, I had the pleasure of speaking with the wonderful Caroline Webb, an executive coach, international speaker, and author of the best-selling book, How to Have a Good Day, Harness the Power of Behavioral Science to Transform Your Working Life. A senior advisor to McKinsey, where she was previously a partner, Caroline specialises in teaching people how to apply behavioural science insights to improve their professional lives. She's worked with hundreds of organisations to help their employees become more productive, energised and successful, and her book has been published in 14 languages in over 60 countries so far. Hailed by Forbes as one of their must-read business books and described by Fortune as one of their top self-improvement through data books, I thought now would be the perfect time to dive into some of the core principles in order to explore how we might better understand our mental habits and navigate the constraints and challenges that we face during this crisis. From managing uncertainty by reconnecting with those things of which we can be sure, to working with self-compassion and conscious attention, we discuss what it might look like to regain a sense of control and competence in uncertain times and how through noticing moments of aliveness, joy and energy, we can start to tune in to what gives us a greater sense of depth and meaning in our lives. I reveled in this conversation and although this is the last for the season, I will be back soon to explore how we might work with one another, with technology and with the living environment to create a new, more resilient future. Until then, thank you so much for listening. I really hope you enjoy the show. So Caroline, thank you so much for joining me. I'm really, really excited to chat with you, especially because it's been a little while since we last spoke. So um, I'm excited for this conversation. Me too. I'm really happy to be here. (laughs) So I'm going to start with the question that I ask everybody, which is from your perspective, What do you think is happening in the global human psyche right now? Gosh, that is a question. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think that a lot of our lives have gone on pause and some of that is quite traumatic and some of that is uh, is interesting in how it's affecting the way that we're thinking. We've got so much that we were taking for granted that was trundling along day in, day out, part of our daily habits that we thought was a given. And now it's not, it's been taken away. And I think it is for many people, as well as being traumatic and challenging, there is a a moment of pause, a moment of space to to rethink what it is that we want to be and do going forward. Mm. And I am seeing that, uh, that, that duality, the challenge, but also the opportunity in almost everything that I'm, I'm encountering at the moment. Mm. I'm curious also how some of these things that you're noticing tie into the insights that you explored in your fantastic book, which I highly recommend, which is called How to Have a Good Day, Harness the Power of Behavioural Science to Transform Your Working Life. And in the book, you explore how to use insights from behavioural economics and psychology and neuroscience to transform our approach to everyday working life. And of course, with the pandemic, it's basically turned everyone's work lives upside down in a multitude of ways. And so I'd like to ask, 
what are some of the key findings or principles from your book, in your research, that you think we could most benefit from using at this moment in time? It's a good question because, uh, you know, a lot of the a lot of the advice that used to be out there about thriving and performing well uh, at work now feels very out of reach. Mm. And I've found myself going back to really some of the fundamentals that were underpinning the things I wrote about in the book, which are still true, which is about these habits of mind that we can all develop that help us uh, help us navigate the ups and downs. Because the thing is, you know, I wrote a book called How to Have a Good Day, actually quite deliberately. I didn't call it How to Have a Great Day, How to Have an <laughs> Awesome Day, How to Have an Amazing Day, because I was really focused on acknowledging that we face challenges, actually even at the best of times, and saying, uh, okay, well, look, given, given what we know about the way that the brain works and what drives the way we think and feel, what what is there that the research tells us about how to how to navigate the ups and downs so it was very much a book written about navigating constraints um and so those mental habits i mean the th- three that are coming up a lot uh are compassion mm-hmm. the practice of of self compassion with compassion towards others um there's a a big theme around certainty and managing uncertainty by reconnecting with your certainties and also a big theme about directing your conscious attention towards the things you really want it to be focused on. Mm. And these are things that are actually, you know, good in all times uh, to, to, to think about. But right now, they're incredibly helpful because they're the things that you can use even on days that are, you know, the days where you're struggling to, to take a shower or to, to get out of bed or to, to go for the walk, you know, you're supposed to go for. Mm. It's curious from a personal perspective, I've definitely found it probably I was talking about this with my partner probably about every two weeks in the last month one of us will hit a day where we just flatline on motivation and it's the strangest thing it's like someone just pulls out the plug and you wake up and you're awake but there's just zero desire to do anything and it's such a strange sensation it's not something that I'm particularly familiar with and I wonder if you have noticed that with people you've worked with and you mentioned about dealing with the uncertainty by honing in on the certain aspects of what one wants in life. Is that something that you're finding is helping people to regain the sense of motivation? I think everybody is having those days occasionally where there's just much more weight on your shoulders. Mm. You know, from the moment you open your eyes, there's just a heaviness that that you don't normally experience. And I think that that is a a symptom of the the stress that we're all facing and and obviously some uh, to an extreme degree. And yes, even in situations of post-traumatic stress, uh, it's been shown that focusing on the things that are certain in a highly uncertain environment can help you regain a sense of control Mm. and a sense of competence that can give you back a feeling of forward movement. And so that's why that's why certainties and focusing on certainties is, is a theme I'm seeing again and again. And at the moment, it's very easy to say, well, oh my gosh, I've got no idea. I mean, what is certain? There's no certainties. Everything is up in the air. But actually, there are always some things that you know. You know, you do know some things for sure, even if it's just how you feel right now. And there's uh, good evidence to suggest that even just labeling how you feel right now actually helps Mm. to stabilize your sense, uh, your your emotional state of mind. You know who you are, you know where your values are and your strengths are, and you can remind yourself of that and think about how you could play to them today. And you know typically that there are a few things you can control, even if there's a lot that you can't. You know what you can choose to learn from a situation, you you know what attitude you can choose to have, if not, you know, forever, then at least today. And that is really helpful. If you can refocus on, you know, things you know, things you are, and things you can control, then that, that, is, that is really helpful for motivation and mood. Mm. One of the things I've noticed, at least anecdotally, and I'm um, interested to hear if you've seen something similar amongst your friends or your clients, is that within my circle of friends and acquaintances, there does seem to be both a lamenting of the loss of old structures and habits and the taking of this moment to consider how to develop new ones. So I'm interested to ask, in your 20 years of coaching senior leaders across all kinds of organisations and industries, what are some of the main themes that come up when people are exploring their habits and whether they work for them and how to change them? I was coaching a senior woman yesterday, who I've known actually for, for a while, and she said that she was noticing in herself a real, uh, she was very eloquent about it, she was noticing in herself a real shift from 
uh, focusing on achievement to focusing on meaning mm. and from focusing on doing to focusing on being. And I wrote, <laughs> I wrote down her words because I thought that's just, that's a beautiful encapsulation of what I'm hearing a lot in my coaching sessions right now. I do feel that there's a little bit of extra courage that I'm hearing coming through, um, a little bit of extra focus on how to be helpful to others and a little bit of extra focus on how to build a sustainable model of what it means to to be uh, a professional, a family member, um, and to, to, to think about what that life wants, what they want that life to look like in the years to come. I love this idea of the shift towards being and meaning. Also in the, in the sense that because so many people, if they have the ability to work from home, are having to navigate blended roles, blended spaces where boundaries can be tricky to assert consistently. I wonder how much that throws into sharp relief the amount of time and effort spent in specific roles and whether that ends up being something which people enjoy or find value in. When people in your consultancy are asking you for guidance around meaning, are there any particular practices that you can encourage them to engage in to help uncover maybe a little bit more about what that meaning in their life might look like for them? I think there are very practical things that you can do to start to get closer to a sense of greater purpose or meaning. Um, mm. it, it sounds very daunting if, if that's not central to your life right now. But I always get people to start by actually doing a bit of data gathering, going back through uh, the last few years and thinking about real peaks for themselves. So uh, I, don't mean, I don't mean the sorts of things where we feel like, oh, we did the thing we were supposed to do and yeah, yeah, that was great. But the real moments where you just think, wow, I feel amazing and I feel like I'm, uh, you know, you can describe it in different ways, fully expressed as a human being. I feel like this is what I was born to do. I feel like I could do this forever without being paid. You know, whatever phrasing it is, something that really gives you energy and that brings out the best in you. And actually, a lot of the time, we do not take as much care to analyse ourselves as much as we analyse the stuff of whatever our day jobs include. Mm. So actually just taking a moment to say, OK, I'm going to go back and think about those moments which were truly fantastic, whether they're in our community life, our family life, our professional life, and start to join the dots and say, OK, well, what are the, what are the common themes here? And there's often some common values or strengths that people are playing to. There's often some particular settings uh, or types of ways of working that come out mm. as patterns uh, that feel, you know, particularly energising for people. And then often they surface, you know, really sort of odd little, oh, well, hang on, I see now there's a cause here. There's a, there's a thing I care about that I find uh, seems to give me a boost uh, when I work on it. So that's the practice. Is, uh, and, and once you get better at noticing those moments of true joy and energy and, and, and motion and purpose, uh, it becomes easier to, to stitch together a clearer sense of how to get more of that into your life. Mm. Oh, I love the sound of that. I feel like I want to embark in some of those practices myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a good starting point because we just don't think about, you know, we, we're so focused on what's the next thing, what's the next thing, what's the thing we should do that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a really, it's a nice exercise to do because it, even if nothing else it, it actually sometimes draws your attention to moments that were wonderful that you actually didn't perhaps stop to appreciate at the time mm. it's making me laugh because um I've been obviously in Spain we're kind of a bit more confined than in the UK but I've been lamenting the loss of my little patch of garden in London and uh and in my flat in Barcelona, I've got a beautiful little alcove. And I decided to start collecting seeds from the organic fruit and veg that I was having from the local shop. And I thought, fuck it, I'm just going to dry these little guys out and I'm going to plant them. <laughs> and, you know, thinking that nothing would happen. And now I've got, I would say, probably about 60 seedlings, six of which are ginormous squash plants, which are now growing in my tiny little alcove. And it was one of these things that started off as, oh, you know, I love gardening. That's a moment of joy. Let's see what happens. And now I'm going to end up with a massive, I don't know, like, forest garden in my uh in my second store story flat anyway. that's fantastic it's literally <laughs> born fruit <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, exactly <laughs> um okay so in terms of moving into into ways to adapt ourselves to the current situation what are some of the behavioral shifts we can practice to create more space in our daily lives mm. for finding balance 
um, maybe between the chores that you have to do. I know a lot of people have families just kind of for managing ourselves and our time a bit better without becoming too overwhelmed or burnt out. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of different answers to this. And of course, everybody's situation at home is so, so very different. Mm. It's very, I, I'm very wary of sort of saying you should do this or you should do that because, you know, everyone's in a different, different state of mind and different um, family situation and so on. But I will say, again, go back to the mental habits. You know, I think that there's a lot you can do in your own head, actually. Mm. And uh, so, for example, I do think being compassionate to yourself, thinking about, okay, well, what's the smallest thing that I could do that would take me in the direction that I want to go? Uh, rather than perhaps starting with the big goal and saying, okay, well, this is what I want to achieve by the end of the day. Maybe just be a little kinder to yourself and say, what's the very smallest first step I could take? And feel good about that progress and pat yourself on the, the back for, 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 for a tiny, tiny first step. You know, it might be that on a normal day, in a normal year, you know, you would plough through 40 emails, you know, in a mere few minutes and you'd be just like this complete inbox ninja. Um, you know, may, maybe today, maybe today you just need to pick the two or three that you absolutely have to reply to. And that is what you're going to focus on and you're going to get that done and you're going to feel good about it. Mm. So I think that, you know, that compassion of realising that your mental and emotional resources are less than they normally are, uh, and working with that is is a really good place to start. I love this idea of compassion and it's so much easier, at least for me, I don't know how you find it, to think of it as this abstract, as this wonderful thing like one does maybe with poetry and to think, oh yeah, you know, it sounds like a wonderful thing. And And yet on an hourly basis, I find it really hard to practice. And it's this whole thing of not beating oneself up for not performing at the level which one was performing before. And I think that even the language that we use around that is so interesting because yeah. there is this sense, at least from the conversations I've had with people around me, that we're kind of thinking about the ways that we were working before, about having to have certainty, to have drive, to be doing more, better, etc. this kind of upward um, momentum. And connecting that with a sense of performance and how performance in some ways is disconnected from a sense of relaxing into being. And these different words that we use to describe how we work, I think can be quite enlightening in terms of how much we want of each. So how much do I want to put on a good show to perform, etc.? Yeah. How much do I actually want to be able to maybe bring more of myself into this and what might that look like? Yeah. And in the last... Oh, no, absolutely. I think in the last week uh, or two, you know, if I think about some of the repeating themes in my my coaching sessions, a lot of what's coming up is... Uh, a decision or a realization of the power of setting more boundaries of mm. um, I mean these are people who are still working but they're they're just focusing a little bit more on the fact of they're noticing anxiety and stress and mm. then they're, they're noticing that they have some habits about you know viewpoints about you know the fact that they've got to keep working when actually you know they would do better work if they stopped and took a break and and gave their brain a chance to refresh and so I do see perhaps a little bit more discussion of of that mm. uh you know and a little bit more acknowledgement of the whole person the whole human being that needing to solve for something that feels sustainable all around um and that is I think that's you know my, it's very hard to talk about silver linings when there's so much death mm. and I'm focusing a lot on how to get uh, coaching support to frontline um, healthcare workers and first responders. So I'm very, very nervous about, you know, talking about silver linings from this situation. But I do think that if there's one good thing that could come out of this, it is more of an understanding that we need to think of ourselves as whole people mm. and we need to solve for the whole person in ourselves and in our colleagues mm. um, and in our in our families yeah even in the ways in which people seem to be more genuinely aware of the context that people are bringing from wherever they're working absolutely I've had several meetings yeah several meetings in the last in the last week in particular where um someone quite senior that I was working with had his kid come into the room while he was trying to have a meeting and it's and it's the sense of just you suddenly realise how much other people have on their plates and how much strength and effort it requires to manage everything all at once um, in situations in which everyone's being demanded a lot of. And uh, yeah, all the way from like you know, family people to students who are flat sharing and trying to get on with their studies on broadband, which is being shared by six other people or whatever it might be. It's um, Yeah, 
the point of compassion I think is really key and I hope we don't lose that I hope we you know, I hope I hope that this is a bit of a reset in thinking about our colleagues uh, and our our friends as you know as as rounds of people I mean I think even what you were saying about the fact that we're acknowledging that there are some days that are not good days you know that are that we where we start with this sort of weight on our shoulders and and how how perhaps we're opening up a little bit more about that and mm. I mean obviously one of the big themes in uh, in well-being in the last few years there's been much more openness in talking about mental health and and the fact that many of us have uh, have days and moments when you know we're not feeling great and for some people that stretches into weeks and, and years of not feeling um, not feeling fully in control of their minds in the way that they want to be and I think you know if we can if we can hold on to that and recognize that actually this is this is going on more now but it's always part of our friends lives our families <laughs> lives and and to be a little kinder and saying okay so what's going on for you how are you doing that would be something that i i'd, I'd hope that we would hold on to and i think especially in the context of cultures in which that kind of direct um, communication that speaks to the emotional state that we find ourselves in like in the uk it's something which we've had to talk about more and more publicly because it's something which is not woven into the fabric of everyday conversation. Uh, and so I think that this practical practicing of this abstract idea of talking about one's state, talking about one's inner landscape, yeah. suddenly is now being you know, put to all of us. The opportunity in the sense that we're being faced with it is, is here. And I think what's interesting, at least from the professional perspective also, is the ways in which a lot of even rather traditional businesses like banks, etc., will now start some of their calls with a quick fire round of, OK, so how's everyone doing? And finding new language. So to say, OK, instead of saying, well, I'm feeling really low, they might use language like, um, you know, I had a bit of a wobble last week or whatever it is. But finding ways to name states as they arise and bringing that into the conversation is just that's huge. It's such a huge shift, yeah. I think. And I think something like that's probably hard to rein back. Yeah. And I, th I mean, going back to what I was saying about, you know, certainty and the fact that actually just even acknowledging and saying, what is it? We, one thing we know for sure is how we feel right now. Um, just the sheer fact of psychologists call it affect labeling, labeling your, your affect. Your affect is a, you know, another word for emotion. The sheer fact of labeling your state of mind mm. has been shown to mm. reduce the state of alert in your brain at that time. And mm. it's, it's quite a powerful little thing just to say actually okay yes I hear you I, I notice that you are feeling even when you're talking to yourself that is <laughs> um, I, no I notice that you seem to be a little frustrated right now or you need seem to be a little upset okay so why is that uh-huh okay and just that sheer fact of having that brief conversation with yourself um, you know, it helps to get has you know measurably moves you through uh, to, to a more productive and, and um, state of mind. And I think that's great if we can bring that into our, our team norms and our family norms more, more firmly and fully. That, I think that would be really good. Mm. One of the things that I'd like to also explore is the ways in which we think of and practice resilience. How does this show up for you in your practice? Mm. Well, I mentioned at the beginning that conscious attention was something I think about a lot because our our conscious attention is really the currency of our lives. It, it's what mm. we notice. It's what, what this the reality that we seem to experience, and it's only a portion of actual reality because we can only process a certain amount of what's around us at any given time. Um, we, you know, there are trillions of pieces of data around us at any moment, and our mm. brain can only consciously process I don't know fifty bits of that. I mean, that's that's one estimate. <laughs> so you're constantly making choices about what to notice and what to disregard. And one of the most powerful interventions for resilience is to notice where you're putting your attention and choose to put it elsewhere. And what I mean by that is that um, the things that we tend to notice, that we tend to consciously notice, have been found to be those that match our ingoing state of mind. And mm -hmm. That's, you know, what our grandmothers used to call getting out of bed on the wrong side. If you, if you start in a negative mood or with negative expectations, your brain will helpfully make sure that you see everything that confirms that you're right to have those expectations mm. and to have that mood. And, uh, you know, so you sp spill something on yourself in the morning because you're, you know, not properly awake and that's really annoying. And then, then that puts you in a... <laughs> 
grumpy mood and then you notice everything that goes wrong with the technology and everything that's just really upsetting. You read all the bad news in the uh, newspaper and then you notice all the bad news that, uh, you know, is around you and and you can get into a negative spiral really, mm. really quickly. And you don't even know you're doing it. You think you're perceiving reality. Um, so what can you do? I mean, you can acknowledge that your brain actually can only process a part of what's going on around you and you can be a bit more deliberate about saying okay well look I know I know there's a lot that's really really just very (laughs) terrible now what about in the next few minutes if I could just force myself to notice three good things Hmm. and you know it could be the leaf rustling on the tree outside the window or it could be you know the dog that pops up on the zoom in a really (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> intriguingly <laughs> cute way uh or it could just be it could just be that you're really enjoying this piece of toast that you're eating right now because you know that's that's where you're at and just by focusing on a few good things you tell your brain oh okay so you, I seem to want to focus on good things then I'll see more good things and it's a it's a really it's one of the fastest interventions I know for resetting and giving giving us back a bit of resilience in the moment, even when the news is bad. And it's really, really important when you're surrounded by so much bad news to, to do this little reset. Mm. Sounds like um, a lovely way to practice gratitude. Yeah, I mean, you know, there are loads of different traditions out there that have been moving towards the same conclusion for for I was going to say years, but decades, you know, mm. centuries, you know, <laughs> such old traditions about choosing where to, where to put your attention. This is not new, but I think what is new is that we now understand the the, the neuroscience underpinning it. Mm. Um, we do we understand that our brain is a pattern making machine, and it's it's trying all the time to lighten the load on the, the small amount of your consciousness that is that is. Um, that you're able to bring to the world because you're always trying your brain is always trying to take shortcuts and so <laughs> uh, because you you know you only have a certain amount of processing capacity <laughs> and so you know yes uh, it, it turns out that you can be deliberate about where you put your attention and it is going to be transformative and yes that is why all those gratitude exercises work um, and so whatever the tradition as you're listening to this whatever your tradition is it's true. <laughs> you know, there'll be different language to describe it, but it's all getting to this same underpinning neurological phenomenon of, of, of per- perceptual filtering mm. and matching what your ingoing state of mind is. It's a curious one because I find that often um, one of the things that I'm drawn to the most now in terms of getting myself into a state in which I feel more connected and more whole, it comes down to being engaged in things that are more embodied. So for instance, um, choosing to Mm. make something food wise or to eat something or to have a hug, whatever it might be, but they seem to be much more embodied solutions, let's say. And I wonder if this is something which is showing up for you in conversation in the coaching, because with all the social distancing that's been put into place, when we lose things that we are um, habituated to, the sense of losses looming larger than gains, which you find in behavioural mm. economics, means that we then often attach greater significance and value to the thing that we've lost. Mm. And I wonder if the loss of social contact and physical contact is sort of shifting at a deeper level the ways in which we value these things. Is this something that comes up in conversation at all in your practice? Um, I think yes, absolutely. I think that there are actually a a few different reasons. Um, So you very eloquently described one there. Another is that um, our brains find it easier to process specific, tangible, concrete things than abstract Mm. things. Um, So if you have a list of words to try and remember, you will tend to remember the things that are kind of tangible words like, you know, bed and chair. And <laughs> I'm, so, I'm immediately thinking of everything that involves rest right now. But, um, you know, th- we're more likely to be able to think and remember uh, those words than abstractions like, uh, you know, democracy or, or um, you know, words that are about sort of future possibilities, but are not actually here and now. So that's at the best of times. At the best of times when we like concreteness and specificity and tangibility and things we can imagine and hear and see um and so yeah i mean you know when 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 things are so uncertain and the future is so uncertain i think that's another reason that we are drawn to things that we can feel and touch and that we can know there's a there's a you know just a feeling when you if you cook something like you've done Mm. it there's no 
yeah. ambiguity about whether it <laughs> works or not. Like it's there. You've made the yeah. thing. It's like your plants. The plants are there. You've made the plants. The plants have grown. This is great. This is real. <laughs> There's no uncertainty about whether it's there or not. It is right there. And that is very yeah. pleasing and, and soothing. <laughs> Um, and I, I say I'm laughing but I mean I think it's very profound I think you know that many of us have got a bit disconnected from that sense of physicality and place and connection to 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 you know nature and to 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 using our hands to make things and I I I do think that uh you know we do get some some sense of resilience from that but also some sense of pleasure Mm -hmm. so often seen I guess sometimes if I'm running a workshop and I've got a group of grown-ups and I tip a bunch of Lego out in front of them. Bear with me. Bear with me. (laughs) Now, uh, build a model of how you want things to be. And then initially everyone's laughing and then they settle into it. Or, you know, or I'll get people to take model with some kind of coloured plasticine and, you know, get them to, you know, maybe we've done that exercise of Mm. peak experiences. And then what do you, what does that tell you? And what are the patterns? And what might that tell you about how to get more sense of meaning into your life and you know oh and by the way what we're going to do before dinner is you're going to you're going to make a plasticine model of what's what's emerging for you and you know you can say it with a smile on your face every single time everybody gets super engaged and it's just the inner five-year-old that that of poking and making and and tweaking it's just such a delight it's such a delight I think there's definitely something there about the play and the physicality of it yeah, and I wonder actually how much, when you start to engage more into that side of things, so making stuff, touching stuff, being present physically, what that does to the way in which we value the old way that things were. So um, mm. for myself, at least, you know, coming home from a full day in recent years, it's been a full day of art, so painting or drawing, whatever, coming home, having to quickly eat something before then working on consultancy work or projects for events that I've got coming up and just using that tiny amount of time to cram in food and now of course everything has changed and I'm in the fortunate position where I've I have some time that I can spend on cooking for myself and suddenly it becomes this thing which is um, rewarding in and of itself and it's made me reassess well how much pleasure do I actually get from sitting at my emails and firing off whatever I need and of course it kind of creates a different frame around it and it means that my my priorities have, have since shifted I wonder for you what you think for some people the priorities might be when we emerge into this kind of everyone's saying it's the new normal but what are the priorities that you're seeing floating to the top of people's lists as they go back towards a sense of everyday work as we think about coming out of lockdown? Well I think people are much more appreciative now of the importance of connection Mm. I do feel that um you know the the experience we've had of working remotely and connecting remotely will um will get a lot of people over a hump that they were experiencing before of saying oh virtual isn't as good it it isn't but it's much better than nothing Mm. and there were lots of people that I knew who said, oh, I don't really, I, I just don't, I, I just don't like the whole kind of virtual thing. It's not really for me that I consequently didn't have much interaction with, you know, um, between very, very occasional in-person sightings. <laughs> and now I I feel I've, several of those people have said to me, OK, I get it now. I get it now. And although now, of course, we are going through the other to the other extreme where we're all now zoomed out and we've, we, we're so sick of it and we just really, really want to stop being on video now, but please. Uh, but, uh, but, um, but, you know, the, I think that the pendulum will swing back a bit, but I think, you know, that, that feeling of the power and the importance of connection and of building that into your week is going to be, I, I hope that that doesn't go away. And mm-hmm. I, I do feel like, now that we all understand that it is possible to do it without meeting in person, that it will never be an excuse that we can't actually see each other in person. Hmm. I wonder if alongside this, there is going to be a retention of the flexibility that we're seeing. So for people deciding that maybe they don't want to get back on their Mm. three hour daily commute. So an hour and a half each way into London and back home again. Yeah. Um, Yeah. There's definitely one, there's one, um, 
CEO that I coach, uh, and he's, you know, he, he loves his family very much. I mean, you know, I guess everybody does, but uh, he in particular, you know, he's very, very close to his wife and his, his children and always likes to be home if mm-hmm. he can. Travels half of the time because he's, you know, he runs a global company. Mm-hmm. And so the fact is that he's starting to think, well, actually, here I am. This is a tough time. But there's something that is released in him, relaxed in him, mm. because he's with his favourite people all the time, mm. and he's not exhausted all the time. And so I do think that one of the things we'll want to talk about is what does he want to retain from this? How much, you know, how much does he want to reset from heavy travel to 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 being at home more? Um, which is the sort of prosaic way of talking about it, but. It, you know the 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 deeper point is you know oh he's reconnected with a model that really works for him that gives mm. him energy and joy and pleasure and and love and all the good things that that replenish him um wouldn't it be nice to see if he could hit reset on the model that's going to give him back more of that to give him you know more resilience so i think there's going to be a lot of conversations i hope all of us will be thinking about that i do I mean, of course there are there's a huge huge amount of the population that is experiencing this period in a in a much less uh reflective way because they are on the front line and whether that's you know healthcare workers or emergency services or people in in stores uh transport uh you know there are lots of people who are not experiencing this space to reflect Mm. and this kind of so i do I, I do I am also thinking about what it's like for them coming through this uh with a sort of high level of, of fear and stress every day and I do hope we're going to also spend a you know time as society thinking about how to give back to the people who have given so much or are giving so much right now it seems to me like a a really useful moment to deeply assess how we might redesign the ways in which we live on all levels so if you yeah. like you say I love that idea of you know, finding the space to find the model that really does replenish us. And in the case where people do not have that space because they're really being stretched uh, by virtue of the, the job that they that they perform, um, what might we do as a society to help alleviate some of those pressures and to give them the space that they're really going to need? Because, yes, of course, everyone's under anxiety and um, different forms of uh, pressure, but I think there is probably a very different flavor to that when you're risking burnout uh, from yeah. being yeah being in those difficult situations absolutely I also think there's there's something interesting about and I'm wondering how long we need to be in this state of lockdown in order for these mm. habits and new senses of preference uh, to really sink in and stay as a kind yeah. of I think it's a good question new baseline if you like but with so many people being unable to travel you know, like the CEO that you coach and many of us, even if it's just, you know, flying to go to conferences or commuting to get into work, how much will want to go back into the travel heavy uh, ways of working and how much actually maybe businesses will realise they're, they're wasting money on shipping people and flying people and the rest of it. What are your thoughts around that? Do you think there will be lasting change? And that's an imaginal sort of space right now in which we're having this conversation. But what's your sense? I think there will be lasting change. I think there will be a little bit of bounce back, you know, if people, you know, excited to travel again. And so I think that there will actually Mm. be, um, you know, some rebound. But yeah, every company that I know is, is, is rethinking, is rethinking the amount of office space they need, is rethinking the amount of travel they really need (laughs) to do, is rethinking actually, well, hang on, this was a, this was sort of something we'd said we wanted to do anyway, to travel less because of the environmental consequences. And now actually, we've just suddenly proved that we can, it's not ideal, but we can massively reduce the amount that we travel. So yeah, I, I, I do see businesses thinking about what's the model that we need going forward, because, um, I mean, you've just seen that uh, Twitter has just said that their employees can work from home for as long as they like forever <laughs> pretty much i mean well, who, know, who well. knows about that you know <laughs> obviously sort of we're we're all you know living by the seat of our pants and kind of you know trying to make mm. decisions and prop policies on the fly but but yeah i, I think that that you think we're going to see a lot more of that a lot more of that um i think that there's still 
things that are really good to do in person. There are still certain mm. types of interaction, building trust, um, you know, smelling each other's kind of pheromones so that we can <laughs> yeah. kind of feel like this person is not a threat, they're an ally, you know, that sort of thing. Um, obviously, I don't walk into a room saying that. But, <laughs> but you know, there are some things that in person you, you can establish a sense of connection that yeah. goes deeper than, than on screen. Yes, of course. But I think the idea that you can be more deliberate in saying, does this really need to be in person? I think that's absolutely going to be part of what what happens next, for sure. Mm -hmm. Maybe that there's more choice that opens up. And it's interesting, so many of these businesses that were very reluctant um, to go (laughs) digital have now just had to. It's kind of just forced everybody online where the technology is possible and the infrastructure is there, um, or where the infrastructure is possible. It's forced people to really make that shift. So I wonder... Yeah, I wonder how much of that will stick. Yeah. What change do you feel that you're most surprised by throughout this period? Hmm. What am I most surprised by? Surprise is a high bar, right? Um, (laughs) Given that I focus on human behaviour. I I think that it has been really beautiful to see uh, with the the clapping and the the sort of ceremonies around appreciating people who are working in care and healthcare. Um, It has been really lovely on our street to see how that has emerged as a weekly ritual and we're getting to know our neighbours mm. and it, you know in the centre of London <laughs> let me tell you that is more special than it might sound you know there is just this sense of I see you I have you know we are from potentially different worlds different you know we don't know uh, that much about each other but we know that we share this and that has been just beautiful to mm. see emerge um, I think that, that, you know, because I think that um, the simplicity of the, the ritual, you know, we, we know that rituals are powerful, but the, the simplicity of the ritual and the, the stickiness of it has been really mm. striking. And how has the situation shone a light on what you really value and hold dear? Well, uh, I do also like sticking my fingers into dirt <laughs> and trying to make things grow out of the... <laughs> um, so, I, you know, I think now, I have to say, I'm really, I'm really shocked at like, how little I watered plants before. And now, you know, just there's a bit of a reset on just the amount of care that I think a plant needs and, and deserves. Um, so... <laughs> So that's uh, so. I mean, that's a small example, but it's part of the bigger thing you were talking about earlier on of reconnecting to making things with your hands and just you know that that sense of uh, yeah being grounded. Um, yeah, that that's been a that's been a that's been a really really big thing. Um, I have I, <laughs> I have signed up for so many. I'm on so many different groups that are about plant identification oh wow um it's it's my happy place it's become a really happy place because it's so it's not consequential and nothing terrible is going to happen but it's fun and it's lovely and you know just sort of playing around talking about plants and and identifying plants so that has become a you know a much bigger part of my life than I think I ever thought it might be (laughs) I mean I'm still someone who kind of planned it planned and thought about planting but you know that that has just gone to to a whole new whole new level for me now so I'm very excited to hear about your experiments (laughs) (laughs) I think you should run off and go visit a workshop and do some planty things together that would be so much fun (laughs) yeah that 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 would be great that would be great we've got a so we do have a tiny backyard but it's completely in shade so I'm very good at shade plants ask me anything about shade plants I've got no (laughs) idea about plants that that get sun (laughs) and they are quite specific I'm realizing just how much I didn't know about plants I mean it's a whole well clearly it's a complex ecosystem which sounds so facile to say (laughs) but but you know when you're surrounded by a few trees and other humans dogs the occasional cat um, it's amazing how little we, we pay notice to all these other complex beings, basically. It's just... Um, and yeah. how much personality they have. I check my plants. This is going to make me sound bonkers, but I check my plants maybe 10, 12, 15 times a day, especially if I'm stressed working. And in the space yeah. of even an hour, if one of my little tomato seedlings is wilting, I give it some water and it springs back up. And it's amazing how much... like it's Their lives are actually quite... Um, 
exciting. There's, there's chaos and crazy shit going on in my alcove. <laughs> There's a, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that plants do have a, a type of brain. They have nervous system. They communicate with each other. And so ever since, so my mother's also an avid gardener and um, uh, she, you know, she waited for a couple of decades while I kind of caught up with the whole idea. <laughs> um, I'm finally there. So now we talk about plants. And she, she, she said to me the other day, you know, if I'm, when I'm pruning, I, I apologise to them and I, you know, I, I try and say soothing things. And I said to her, so Aww. do I. <laughs> so do I. So do I. So, you know, our compassion levels are very high right now. But, you know, actually that reminds me, going back to what you were saying about how long, how long is it going to take? Is this going to be long enough? I mean, this mm. is a funny way of framing it, right? Because we want it to be over as quickly as possible. But is it long enough for real change to stick? And mm. her feeling was that, because she was born in the middle of the Second World War, and mm. she she was born in France with bombs falling around uh, her on Oof. the West Coast. And um, she, she said that she wasn't sure it was going to be quite long enough uh, because she said, you know, she was talking about the war being six years and that this had, you know, felt very different. Um, but now as time is passing, she'd said that sort of, you know, two months ago. Mm. I don't know. I think, I think the, the pace of change has accelerated compared with the Second World War because we have social media. So everything that we do is so much more amplified that I think change can happen for good and for, for, for ill. Change can happen a lot faster in our environment today. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think also the rapidity of the way in which we share information and the rapidity of the ways in which we've had to adapt to maintain connection, to maintain livelihood, where that, you know, the, the, the switch to virtual has been possible. The fact that the infrastructure has been there and that, you know, a lot of the frontline workers that we don't necessarily think of as frontline workers include people who work on making sure that our digital platforms are up to speed, that they can sustain the amount of traffic that they sustain, etc. And so I think that there's something really interesting about that as well, is that because we have this infrastructure in place, uh, a lot of what has required changing has been our approach to how we use them, our ability and reluctance, in some instances, to letting certain things go. So I think mm. this idea of, you know, maybe the cheeky long weekend and you jump on a plane because it's convenient, it's easy and it's woven into the fabric of most of our lives. We don't necessarily think twice about maybe, you know, going somewhere closer to home. And yet now um, we're having to depend on other infrastructures to get some of those same satisfactions. So I wonder yeah. how much of that plays into it as well and how different that might be from, from what it was in, in, this, in this lady's generation. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, the changes that have stuck in the wartime generation are, are, are really big. You know, if even mm. a proportion of that sticks for us, then that would be great. I mean, if you think about how much, uh, you know, our parents' generation um, seek to avoid waste uh, in food. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, that <laughs> there's a sort of a whole set of attitudes about um, about eating and about cooking that you know, is, is a, was a huge thing in its own right. And so I think, yeah, if we can make do and mend and, mm. and thinking about sort of not, not throwing things out, not throwing clothes out, if we can retain even a small proportion of that, that would be great. Yeah, I agree. What change do you feel you most long for as we emerge out of this and why? <laughs> oh, I think, you know, I, I do not... I think it's, it's stressful to feel nervous as you're walking past someone on the street mm. and to you know to feel like you you need to get out of their way mm. um and i i've you know i think that that's i can i can cope with the connecting with people remotely i can you know there's been a lot of other good good things that have come out of this period um I'm trying to make myself useful to people who are kind of really in the front line there's lots of you know I think that but I, I think that sort of level of suspicion that's the level of mutual suspicion mm -hmm. I think will be I, I I can't wait for that to 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 dissipate yeah that, that will be it would be really nice to, to go back to something that feels a little bit more, bit more normal on that front yeah because it doesn't infuse sort of everyone's uh, waking moment when you're outside there is always that wariness that sense of vigilance I think um, yeah that doesn't seem yeah, to disappear absolutely mm. 
Absolutely. But as you, I mean, anyone listening to this who's got kids is saying, why is she not talking about kids in school? I mean, my goodness, for my friends who have kids, there is no question what's top of their list. Mm. It's just, you know, it's just to stop being, you know, trying to do both their day job Mm. and their parenting job and their teaching job. Mm. I mean, I think there's no question for them that, that creating that, you know, getting back to a sense of balance so that they are you know, even if even if homeschooling becomes much much more of a thing, which mm. I think it will, mm. um, to to find a a way to to spend less time uh, on that for for parents is going to be you know probably one of the biggest changes they're hankering after. And I hope also an appreciation for teachers. Both my parents actually um, worked as teachers. My dad for a very long time, and my mum for a period of several years. Mm. Uh, and I think what you what you don't realise until you're in the position where you have to teach yourself is how all consuming it is. It's so demanding on every level. And I think if you're in the position where you're a parent having to hold together your family, your partnership, if you're in partnership, your kids, support them, make sure that you're earning money if you're still able to work, support their learning, make sure they don't injure themselves or go mad, which I say it lightly, but mental health, as we've discussed, is so important. And especially for young ones who can't go out and who maybe don't understand the complexity of the situation. That's such a huge shift, I would suggest, in in terms of the ways in which we appreciate the roles that people fulfil who are in the, the teaching and care industries. Yeah, I, I agree. So teaching, caring industries, working in supermarkets mm-hmm. um, and, and other stores, um, I think, you know, cleaning as well. Mm. I had I had a male friend of mine said uh, that he had it, he had cleaned a toilet for the first time in his life. What? And there are any number of levels of shock <laughs> that you can have at that. <laughs> but I th- well. so there's a lot of hidden work that goes on yes. that a lot of people have ignored, either because their partners have been doing it mm. or because uh, they've been paying someone to do it. And that have suddenly become, you know, cooking is the same. Yeah. So we talked about some of the pleasures of making some food and feeling like I did that. You know, that's at least something that I did today uh, that, that, you know, was a tangible outcome. But, you know, the grind of doing yeah. it, not just every evening, but doing it three times a day, breakfast, lunch, dinner, mm. and doing that every day. I think a lot of people are coming out of this of just so much more understanding and appreciation of all the hidden jobs mm-hmm. that actually, you know, whether they're paid or unpaid, support their lives and that will be a great thing to hold on to I've got to say Mm, and a recognition of the amount of emotional work that goes into this yeah which again was often given lip service but most people didn't have to confront that as a lived reality as a lived experience I think that's that's going to be an interesting thing to see yeah yeah absolutely but I will Mm. say you know that the families that I'm close to I do see them they're having a lot of um very open the ones that are that are managing okay are Mm. having really open conversations about workload, uh, about, you know, who needs to be online when, um, who needs, you know, who's going to take the lead on this task or that task. And it's probably, I think for them, my impression is that it's making visible a lot of stuff that went on, uh, unexpressed. And that's actually, you know, that that's in general a a good way to (laughs) to run a household is Mm. to actually be explicit about some of this stuff. Mm. So... Yeah, that, that's 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 been a good thing. <laughs> Something that hopefully some of us can hold on to. So we're coming close to time. Um, I'd like to finish by asking you what question you want people to dwell with at this moment. Well, I think we've hinted at it a few times in our conversation. Mm. You've used the phrase letting go. Uh, I like that a lot. I think that Many of us have had to let go of some stuff in the last couple of months, whether it's a pattern of behaviour or a pattern of consumption mm. um, and, or a pattern of activity. I think it would be really great to ask yourself, what have I let go of that I do not need to bring back into my life? Mm. What would that be for you? <laughs> I think for me, going right back to the top of our conversation, I think self-compassion is is a really... <sighs> acknowledging that there there is going to be periods when I'm going to feel more energy and periods that I'm going to feel less energy Mm. you know and and sort of letting go of a feeling that I need to be charging forward all the time Mm. that would be a good thing to to let go of you know with grace and not Mm. to feel like I have to bring it back Um, and I think you know also I do think that I will continue to 
to cook more sustainably and I will continue to garden. Um, and, you know, there are lots of sort of nice things that uh, I'll hold on to. But the, the, the question of self-compassion is a deeper one that I think is going to be a big, big thing to bring back. Big thing to hold on to, not to bring back that, that worry into my life. Beautiful. What about you? Oh, um, <laughs> what, what would I want to let go of? Or Yes. Um, I think on a practical level, the travel side of things, I want to do a lot less of that. And kind of similar to you, the sense of letting go of the, the sense of pushing and shoulding, like I should be doing this, I should push myself harder to do X, Y and Z. Yeah. Yeah, because actually... I think we can take our foot off the gas and actually enjoy the time that we're here, if that's possible. That's great. Here's to letting go of some of the shoulds. Thank you for listening to The Hive Podcast with me, Natalie Nahai. To find out more about today's guest and the topics we explored, you can visit the show notes page at natalienahai.com forward slash The Hive Podcast. If you have any questions or feedback, you can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn and Instagram at Natalina High. And if you enjoy the show, please give it a rating as it reaches new ears. And also, if there's someone that you feel could be supported by the content of this series, just ping on the link. Thank you again for listening. And I look forward to sharing more with you in the next episode.